Hey everybody. Okay, so we're doing this a little different because I don't have my laptop here at my house uh, that allows me to do the like screencastify version of me teaching the lesson. So we are doing like an impromptu where I am looking at the slide and teaching it. Um, but all you're going to see is me and you're just going to have to like follow along in the slideshow on your own. Like if you just, you know, if you want to click on it and just kind of have me in the background and listen, then you can do it that way. Y'all are creative enough. Technologically, you can figure this out. Um, <clears throat> it is 630 on Sunday night. Had no plans of not being there tomorrow, but my youngest uh, daughter, Avian, my daughter, she's like two and a half. She is now running like 101 fever, has like cold-like symptoms. And so even if this is just your typical two-year-old little virus, they're going to want to test her for COVID. Um, Y'all know how this song and dance goes. So there's a chance I may not be here you know, tomorrow and Tuesday until we can get her results back. And of course, we're clearly hoping for negative. Otherwise, you won't see me for a while. <clears throat> if that's the case, I'll get my computer some kind of way so that this isn't how we handle things. Um, but for now, this is the best that I can do. So Anyways, um, so, you know, tomorrow is Monday. I'm going to need y'all, of course, to be watching this video, but again, also looking through the Unit 8 slideshow starting on slide 41. Um, we ended on Louis the uh biography video on Friday, and Friday, of course, was Louis Day. We had all kinds of fun with him and, um, you know, all the crazy stuff that you'd think almost wouldn't even be true, um, but yet it was. So here we go, 41, the title of the slide is The Spread of Absolutism. And uh, you know, as we've talked about before, after the Thirty Years' War, the Holy Roman Empire really is highly weakened. Um, you know, for 30 years, a very, very brutal war, which was the Thirty Years' War, raged uh, in those states. And once it was over, you have 300 even like smaller states that are now making up the Holy Roman Empire. And so you can imagine if the Habsburgs were having problems centralizing their power and keeping control of the states prior to the Thirty Years' War, it's even worse now. Um, <clears throat> you have um, the emergence of Prussia after the Thirty Years' War. And Prussia is actually going to end up being, and this is P-R-U-S-S-I-A, Prussia, not Russia, Prussia. Okay, and um, they're actually going to be a pretty decent powerhouse in Europe for a while. Um, and so, you know, it's important to note their existence that emerges really after the Thirty Years' War. Frederick William, or the Great Elector, uh, that was his name, is going to kind of lay the foundation for the Prussian state. And Prussia is going to be all about the military throughout their history. They are going to be known for having this amazing standing army. I mean, and, and so that'll, we'll talk about them again. Just that's the main thing that I want you to remember about Prussia is like military is their jam they spend an insane amount of money and, and tax their people to like the nth degree to keep their army really big and really powerful, even when there's like no big threats to them. <clears throat> so just kind of bear that in mind. Okay, so the Austrian Habsburgs, which of course have been the Holy Roman emperors uh, by the end of the Thirty Years' War, their hopes of kind of creating this amazing empire that's all unified under a highly centralized monarchy is sincerely out the window. I mean, yes, they're still the Holy Roman Emperor family and all that, but, you know, not, not even close to being what they were. Uh, and it's never going to be that way. It's never going to become highly centralized. Um, and the only thing that, you know, keeps them 
alive is this almost like kind of bizarre loyalty to them by the people of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, really the only sentiment that holds these like 300 plus little states together is like, oh, they're our royal family. Well, again, I don't really get that, but that's that's how they kind of stay the royal family of the Holy Roman Empire is, is this just kind of like common feeling of, well, that's our royal family and that's just the way that it is. Uh, but again, doesn't make much sense. Um, okay, <clears throat> so it kind of made me, that's why I don't know if y'all remember, but like I laughed really hard during the 30 years war video uh, that John Green did through Crash Course. And he was talking about like, why anybody would want to be a Holy Roman Empire is beyond me at this point. But hey, um, you know, if you were in class that day, every time he said that, I kind of giggled. But, uh, all right, so moving on to Russia right quick. Um, you know, Russia is going to be, I mean, it's kind of, as far as a, as a kingdom goes, it's, it's always behind, all right? It's, it's kind of like the backwater cousin, um, you, <laughs> you could almost say of, of Europe. I mean, everybody, yeah, you're looking, you know, everybody knows it's there and stuff, but for the most part, nobody really pays attention to Russia for a good long while until they get a, a, a monarch by the name of Peter, okay? So Peter the Great um, is who I kind of want to hone in on as far as Russia goes in this particular unit. We'll, we'll talk about Russia a good bit more in other units, but Peter the Great is going to be like one of Russia's like main monarchs because he wants to westernize Russia. He actually, what he does, he dresses up actually as a like a commoner kind of, or like a, I don't know. Yeah, I mean like a commoner. And he um, does this whole tour of Western Europe, but he, he doesn't, he really doesn't want anybody to know that it's him, that he's the czar of Russia, which is why he kind of like goes around like incognito. And he's doing this because he goes to study the like economics and the um, just overall like financial culture of these highly successful Western European kingdoms because he wants to pull Russia into that market like he wants Russia to become you know modernized and westernized and not be the backwater cousin that nobody really pays attention to he doesn't want that and so his big thing is modernize the army modernize the navy modernize our economic platform um so this is why he's known as Peter the Great. I mean, he really does kind of take Russia into this next level as far as a European kingdom goes. Now, the, historically speaking, they still stay kind of behind the times. But if really, if it weren't for Peter the Great, they would be even more behind the times, um, historically speaking. <clears throat> so... He is going to establish the port city of St. Petersburg, um, which of course is is highly famous city there, on the Baltic Sea, and it's so that he can open trade up. You know, like he he's like I, we can't be landlocked. He actually even goes to war with Finland. He goes to war with Finland to acquire the land um, that St. Petersburg gets built upon. So um, this video is one that I want you to watch. I'm not gonna like try to watch it, but you need to. So if you wanna like pause me, watch it, and then unpause me, that would be great. Uh, whatever works best for you. But um, again, the video is about four or five minutes. And then the, the final lesson is European culture after the Renaissance. And this is just telling you, okay, so, you know, we've had the Renaissance and we talked about, you know, how crazy the art world changed, the sculpture world changed. We looked at your high Renaissance masters um, and some of the more notable works of art and things like that. Um, so, you know, so, so what do things look like, obviously, after 
the Renaissance? How does that change things? And then of course, with all the other massive changes taking place in Europe due to the Reformation and the Age of Exploration and all of this, like how does this feed into art and, and literature and things like that within um, European society? And so the art actually of the like 17th century really reflects in a lot of ways, um, all the problems that we've talked about that the 17th century was encountering. So it's a lot of the artwork that if you go and you look back at it, it is of course, no shocker here, it's religious in nature, um, but it's also violent. Like th there's a lot of um, much, th there's a lot more uh, negative emotions that you, that you can see and sense out of the artwork. Um, and hopefully it, when I come back, <laughs> uh, which will be soon, um, dear God, please let it be soon. Um, so you, anyways, we'll look at actually some of that. And, and, uh, there's this incredible article and I know I've, I've brought in, um, you know, my history, National Geographic, magazine before I've you know the Robin Hood article um there's also a really incredible article of a post renaissance artist I'll have to go back in and find which which issue that was from where she um it's a female and and really acquired an amass a really a, an amazing amount of fame um being a female artist during the time and some of and a lot of her artwork is very violent and actually like really dark uh and it and it's and it kind of reflects her anxiety uh over the political and social and economic climate uh, of the 17th century so it's really kind of an interesting article to read um so again, in uh, on slide 47, which was is the title slide for lesson four, it talks about mannerism, which is kind of the new artistic movement. And y'all know me, I'm not an art history person. I do my best at trying to explain it, but I'm just gonna straight up read the definition of mannerism, which is just breaking down the principles of balance, harmony, and moderation, and this emerges in the 1520s and 30s. So, mannerism is what eventually replaces the Baroque movement, and y'all have to play the little clip that I have from, it's the, it's Cogsworth off of Beauty and the Beast, like the original um, cartoon. He like makes a funny little pun. So once you know like Baroque, Europe and like that's actually a whole like artistic time frame you'll get the joke you probably didn't get it when you were little as neither did I but now you can get it and appreciate it but anyways um Baroque artists try to bring as it says like classical ideas of the Renaissance but then mix it with these feelings of religious anxiety and societal anxiety because of all the crap happening that we've talked about already. Um, so again, Baroque art and architecture is all about, you know, showing power, like Versailles. Versailles is like the ultimate, like, Baroque palace, right? Um, I mean, hello, highly richly detailed, um, incredibly magnificent. Everybody's gonna try to copy Versailles to like the end of time, no one gets close. Um, but still like that is the ultimate show right of power and of money and of wealth and of absolutism um but then also if you look at the art at versailles there's a lot of paintings and murals on the wall that depict again like kind of the violence and the anxiety of the 17th century so anyways uh just kind of know that you have major musical talents show up during the this time frame. You have Bach, you have Handel, um, and and so you know their music also reflects kind of the complexity of the 17th century and and people's feelings and anxieties and such. So uh, most people have heard of the Minuet in G Major by Bach. 
Um, you don't know that that's what you're listening to, but you've heard it. So anyways, play that so that you're like, oh, okay, so I've heard Bach, because I mean, you have, trust me, it's in all kinds of crap. Um, and then of course, you can't talk about the 17th century without talking about Shakespeare. And so, uh, and of course, this is super early. I mean, like, you know, he's really more late 1500s, so really late 16th century, early 17th century, but still can't talk about this time frame without talking about Sir Shakespeare, all right? So, um, of course, he is born in, uh, and raised and, and married and his kids grow up and everything in, um, oh my God, what's the matter with me? England, obviously, but why can I think? Stratford-upon-Avon, thank you, brain, for kicking in there. Um, yes, yeah, Stratford-upon-Avon is where he is uh, from, and of course, he moves to London and starts producing and acting uh, in these amazing plays of, of his writing and um, of course, he's, he has, you know, why, why has, that's the, the big, the big question really about Shakespeare is why has he stood the test of time and some of these others haven't? Like, wh why do you know more about Shakespeare than you really know about other really highly notable playwrights and authors? Why is Shakespeare, like, again and again and again brought up and studied and looked at and reproduced? And, you know, how are his works constantly coming back around and, and being made into modern-day movies? Um, you know, when other people's stuff really isn't. Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that he understood psychologically human beings, okay? Like, he got to the root of human nature and put it into his plays. And I've said this in class before, and I'll say it until my dying day. Human nature, it doesn't change, guys. That's the reason why history is so important to understand, is because if you understand the patterns that you see throughout history of human beings, it helps you to not fall into almost like this fantastical or fantasy world of like, oh, this is the way the world could be. Well, sure, it's the way the world could be, but it's not the way that the world is going to be. And I mean, it's 10,000 years of recorded history are going to prove that time and time and time again. Um, and, and that is the reason why his, his stuff lasts. He, I mean, he exploits greed and sex and uh, misunderstandings of emotions and I mean like all the nitty-gritty stuff of being a human that that doesn't change it doesn't matter if you are in the late 1500s early 1600s or you're sitting right in the middle of 2021 I mean like it, it doesn't matter that doesn't change because people really kind of don't change so um that is what makes him brilliant and and that's what makes him just continue you know no, ma no matter what so again video watch it the biography of Shakespeare it's a few minutes um and then the final slide of the lesson is about um Cervantes so Cervantes is also pretty famous he writes Don Quixote uh, and Don Quixote is uh, really, honestly, for those of you that like like fantasy fiction, Don Quixote is the first kind of fantasy fiction novel. Um, you know, so all of you like Harry Potter, um, you know, Lord of the Rings, um, you know, maybe you like the Inheritance series, the the Dragon uh, series. All, all, like, I'm a big fantasy fiction person. I actually love fantasy fiction novels. Um, he is your, he's like your big inspiration, honestly. He's your first fantasy fiction novelist. So um, if you watch that last minute book report that I have a tie to, it's super fast. Like it's literally going through the whole of the book in a matter of seconds. But if you listen to it, you're kind of like, what is going on? Well, it's because again, it's all about this like dream that this guy has and he goes off like to fight this otherworldly thing, you know, like, and anyways, it, it just goes to show you how, again, it's, it's fantasy fiction. And this is the first one ever written. So 
Cervantes, of course, uh, is known for that. And that's how he kind of stands the test of time is that's that he created that genre. So kind of neat. Okay, so that is it. If you have watched the videos, I'm at 20 minutes as far as like lecture and me talking to you. But if you've watched the videos, that fills in the additional really about, I'm going to say probably an additional 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, you should be close to 45 minutes by the time you, you do all of that. So um, again, I'm sorry that I'm not there. Hopefully I can be back. Um, it would be ideal if I could be back tomorrow, Tuesday, but if not hopefully by Wednesday. So again, I'm sorry I'm not there. It was not my intention. She literally started running fever maybe 45 minutes ago. So it is what it is. So, all right. Happy Monday from my home office. So, all right. See you guys later. Bye.